Welcome back. You are listening to Nathy Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcast. This week's episode is dedicated to Steve and Calvin Atkinson. Each have donated a hundred dollars to the channel. Thank you for your donation and your generosity and support. We appreciate it. And this episode is dedicated to once again Steve and Calvin Atkinson. And joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. What's going on, Nate? Great to be here, and I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I did have a good Thanksgiving, though I must admit the turkey I had did come out a little raw, and because I'm colorblind, I couldn't tell it was as pink as it was, and I didn't know until I cut into it, and I put the turkey in my mouth, and it was as cold as a cold cut. Oh, no. I, yeah, it was what, rough. What you need to do is get a thermometer <laughs> and um, stick it right in there, and if it's, if it's, I think it's 155 or 160, um, I think that's yeah. what you want to go for. I think it hit 160. It was near the bone that was still raw. And, you know, I popped it back in for another half hour. I listened. I, I followed the instructions. It said yeah. for this size, it should have been about two hours. I put it in there for two and a half. And it was in the bag. So, you know, speed that process up a bit. And it just didn't come out right. So... They get food poisoning, so that's a. I should be thankful for that. But how how was your Thanksgiving? I know you posted a picture of a pretty big bird I did, on social media. Yeah, I, I cooked a twenty pounder. I'm I'm pretty experienced at <laughs> cooking turkeys. I've I've done them in, I've done them in the in a you know conventional oven. I've done a deep fried turkey as well, which was an interesting experiment. It, was, it came it came out good, but it was just a lot of setup and prep work. But uh, no, we had a good one. It was a, a social distance one. What we basically did was we we stayed home as a family, and then when the turkey was ready, we cut up pieces and sent them out to other family members that live in around town. So it was it was a good day, but it was very very tiring as well. Yes, Thanksgiving can be an exhausting day. And to everyone listening, we do hope you guys had a good holiday as well. Whether And if you don't celebrate it, hope you had a nice long weekend and enjoyed some football and some seasonal beverages and food choices of your preference. And today we're going to talk about a hot topic, and it surrounds the launch of both next-gen systems, the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and Series X. And it is the prominent problem of profiteering or resellers who are purchasing these systems and they're selling them for extravagant prices on eBay, Craigslist, or really any online secondhand seller you can find. And we've seen a lot of reports coming out over the last few days where PlayStation 5s are being sold in the range for around $1,000 upwards to maybe $1,500 or even $2,000 depending on who is trying to sell them. And the Xbox Series X and S are in a similar situation, though it may not be to the extent that we're seeing with the PlayStation 5. And that's not due to lack of interest with the Xbox. It seems that it may simply be that resellers weren't able to get their hands on as many Xboxes because Microsoft's supply seems to be a little lower than what we're seeing for Sony, especially in the Western markets. We know that Sony and Microsoft really didn't allocate all that many units to the Japanese region. They've been prioritizing the North Americas and European regions. MVG, you got an interesting email last week from a reseller. I Why did. do you take us through that right now? <laughs> yeah, so this this tweet um, actually has been picked up by a few outlets, and I don't want to say it's gone viral or anything like that, but it's gone a lot more interest than I had first anticipated but um, I got an email from from someone on November the 16th which is you know it's been a couple of weeks since the email and I when I first got it Nate I just I just looked at it and I just deleted it because you know as as a YouTuber you tend to get like a lot of promotional style emails about hey can you review this game for me or can you you know review this product for me and most of them are, are things that I'm not interested in in looking at, and this was one of them. But when the scalper story started to gain traction, I remembered that email, 
and I was like, oh, I wonder if I still have it. And it was in my trash folder because that's where I, I sent it to. Like I said, <laughs> I didn't really give it too much notice. And I thought, well, hold on, let me let me look at this again. And basically, the email says, um, hello, MVG, my name is such and such, and I work for a PS5 reseller. I would like to know how much you charge for a 10-second ad in one of your videos. Please respond back. And it's like, this is an interesting, interesting email that I received, especially with everything that's been going on. Like I said, when it, when it happened, I didn't really pay, pay it too much attention. We know that there has been severe shortages of the PlayStation 5. It's, it's impossible to find one when they do go on sale, whether, you know, Walmart has their, you know, three times a week or three times a day you know drops of of like 50 systems or whatever they're trying to sell (laughs) that those things get sold immediately so i mean the chances of the average person you and i you know getting a ps5 right now is 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 zero right so i just kind of felt like well you know it's it's the situation that, that that we're in now but you know when i thought about this more nate i was like this is actually interesting what what does this actually mean you know like are are we are we to believe that these resellers are sitting on a lot of stock and they need more advertising more help to get rid of them and i think that's the only kind of conclusion i can come 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 away from this now i'm not suggesting that this reseller that emailed me is a part of the you know the the big groups that have the three and a half thousand ps5s you know the the well organized scalper groups that that have been in in the media recently but i do think it's interesting that they are turning to you know youtubers for for you know advertising and i'm wondering if anyone else um, received something like this as well i definitely would like to know if 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 this went around to a couple of youtubers but um i mean what do you make of this i mean for me i, I think honestly i think i'm not saying that, that they're you know they're desperate to sell their stock right now but i do think they are looking at every possible you know angle to <laughs> advertise right i mean you know, you put you put a 10 second ad spot on a video, you put an ad spot on a video because, you know, they know that I'll, I'll get at least, you know, 100,000 views on a video, right? So that is advertising for them. But look, uh, to be very clear as well, this is not something that I would ever have taken up and accepted uh, in, in, <laughs> in, in any situation. Um, I, I, this is not, this is not, you know, anything that I would be interested in. But what do you think about this tweet you know, if you got something like this in your inbox, you know, what would you make of this and, and and how would you respond to it if you would at all? Yeah, like you, my initial reaction would have been you're going into the, you know, my trash. It probably would have been filtered into my spam folder, you know, in all honesty. But if it somehow did make it to my inbox and it did catch my eye, I, yeah, I would have deleted it. But I definitely, if I had to truly think about it, I probably would have sat there and my initial thought would have been you you bought these PlayStation 5s we're still within that hyped you know opening month you should have no problem selling these just through basic social media whether you know Craigslist Facebook marketplace a local ad in a newspaper if you really want to go that route and you know it should have been very simple to go to YouTube it's either a new form of aggressive marketing where you can get a lot more interest because you maybe you have a lot of stock. And again, I'm not saying it's going to be that 3,500 PlayStation 5 group. Maybe this is a person who just had, you know, 200, which would still come up to, you know, close to a $100,000 investment. And you, you want to reach the biggest market you can. Now, YouTube seems like a risk. Yeah. I mean, this is a worldwide platform where i mean theoretically anyone could have seen that ad had you agreed to it or if any youtuber agreed to it so i don't even know what type of ad you would run 
you know, in no, this type of concept. I, like, I was thinking about that. It's like, let's <laughs> let's let's entertain that. I, I I did this right. Like, first of all, what would I ask for? And the obvious answer is, I would ask for ten PS fives. Right? Give me give me ten PS fives, and then I'll just like sell them at at normal price to people that need them. Right? So, I would do that. You know, I'd do something honorable. But then, then the biggest story is what would i say like, in a 10 second ad well, spot yeah you know? like it's the guy they have sent you a script where like if you're looking for a playstation 5 you can reach out to yoshi at nintendo.com <laughs> and inquire about playing about purchasing a playstation 5 yeah like how would it have actually happened because in that case all of a sudden your email address for the reseller become widely known and we know how the internet works a person would then Google search it, find your location, dox you, you know, something else would have happened. So if you really want to sell a PlayStation 5 and you were going to do an ad, YouTube is not the place to do it. Right. And, you know, it is funny just to think about what would the ad have been? And there's no ad I can craft in my mind <laughs> that makes any type of sense that wouldn't lead to just a disaster for the reseller. Yeah. But... Do you think it was it an act of desperation and panic to say, I want to reach out to YouTube so I can maybe move some of these systems quicker? Or was it just some inexperienced first timer who was, I've gone on all these other social media platforms. The only one I haven't gone to is YouTube. I may as well reach out and see if someone bites. Well, I don't think it was desperation, right? I mean, I think, you know, if you really wanted to unload PS5s right now, you could probably knock off a few hundred dollars off that ridiculous fifteen hundred dollar price that people want and and probably move them a lot faster you know you could drop them to like if you're really if you're really desperate you could drop them to like 850 right or 900 bucks and you, you could you could get rid of them pretty quickly you put them up on ebay right now and as set, set buy it now price and you could get rid of those like no, yeah. no problem right so I think it's all about profit margins, but it's interesting because his email says I work for a PS5 reseller. So, you know, it's not like this is the guy that has the PS5s. Like it's it's like I work for a group, a reseller group, but I don't think it's desperation. I think it's really more about trying to just expand the advertising lanes that, that you can potentially access and... I think they look at YouTubers, ones that that make have made PS5 videos recently that have viewed well. Like I'd be, I'd be, you know, if I'd, I'd want to know if like someone like Mystic, who who obviously covers PlayStation and is a very very popular YouTuber right now, got a similar email as well because I think they're just looking at people that make PS5 content, you know, have recently made PS5 content that has done well on on you know in the algorithm and trying to just open up more lanes of, of ways to sell their product so i don't think yeah. this is a a situation where this guy has to pay his credit card at the end of the month and he's got like <laughs> 20 ps5s you know and he needs fast money because i think if that was the case like i said he'd probably need to drop the price. He'd probably drop the price and he'd be able to sell those. One thing that just stood out to me is that you said in the email how the individual wrote that they work for a PlayStation 5 reseller. And the first thought that came to my mind is commission. Yeah. They want to sell as many PlayStation 5s as they can, maybe by a certain deadline because they get a higher percentage of right. cuts. And then that email makes a little more sense than you know just like an individual who has let's say 100 PlayStation 5s that they're trying to flip, if you're part of a bigger group and maybe that's the incentive, you, you know, you reach out, you can sell this amount of, you know, your allotment of PlayStation 5s by this date, we give you a bonus and you get a higher percentage. And then I, it makes a little more sense then. But yeah, if you're, if you're a reseller of any system that you have used bots or you exploited a retailer to buy thousands of these you definitely aren't in any desperation mode this soon after launch. I mean, we're not even a month into the next generation of these systems. And I go to eBay right now and PlayStation 5s are still consistently selling anywhere between $13 to $1,500. So yes, there is profit to be made here. 
And, you know, you still have the holiday shopping season. Is We're still in the prime of it. These, Do you think those prices will start to drop as... as a little bit. You know, because, I mean, eventually the scalpers are going to be sitting on product and they go, and they they're going to need to move them like once once stock yes. allocations start to to you know to come back and uh-huh. you you like the day when i can log into amazon and i can add one to cart and buy one without it getting taken out from under me right <laughs> i mean i think i'd be pretty worried if i was in one of those groups yeah. that was sitting on 3500 ps5s but uh-huh. eventually they're going to have to drop the price. But I don't think it's, I don't think they're anywhere near that point right now. You know, given no, it's yeah, the fact that these systems and Microsoft and and Sony have both said yeah. that, you know, everything is limited supply until end of fiscal year or start of fiscal year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I don't think they have to be desperate in the immediate because it's still the holiday shopping season. You're still going to have people say, Oh no, I promised my kid one of these next gen systems. I have to pick it up before the holiday because I don't want to disappoint my child. You know, they're spoiled or, you know, maybe this is just a big gift that you just really want to get them for a holiday gift. And some will act in that moment of saying, I know I can get it for $1,500. It's a lot more than I want to spend, but I'm going to give into the reseller which don't do, don't yes. give into these high prices. They eventually stock is going to become abundant. Wait out a few months. And yeah, but people, you know, you have that FOMO effect. People don't want to miss out. It's the new hype. And because we are several weeks into the launch of these systems, you start to lose that hype a little bit. It's beginning to subside, but that roller coaster is going to come back up. And it's right around Christmas is that when we see that rise again, because you see friends who may have gotten it as a gift, or you see maybe, you know, other friends who are parents say, oh, I happen to get my kid a PlayStation 5, or I got a PlayStation 5, and you say, oh, man, I got to find one. So you start getting that FOMO effect again. But then come December 26th, that roller coaster is back down. It's evened out. That hype level has leveled off, and you're okay with waiting. It's really just that holiday rush. And that's what these resellers lean into is that they want to guilt you into buying this. And one thing that these groups never account for is that you're not the only one. There's always a large number of resellers. And what happens when you have a big number of resellers and you have them buying, you know, 3,000, 4,000 PlayStation 5s is you oversaturate your own market, which will bring down the price. If I go to eBay and I see that there's 2,000 PlayStation 5s up there, why am I going to give you $2,000 for yours? Right. Somebody on that list of 2,000 options is going to come in at a lower price. Maybe it's going to come in at $1,100. Well, now that might be the new baseline. That's what people are willing to pay. Yeah. And I mean, I guess that's the risk of this, and I put this in an air quote, business that you have to take if you're a reseller of these high-end you know, electronic products. You live off hype, you live off FOMO, but once those pass and you have excess stock that you have to get rid of, you're gonna come closer to that retail asking price of $500, or you're gonna go back to the retailer which you bought all these from and you're gonna return them and you're gonna break even. And then, you know, people are gonna buy them in the store like they should you know, be able to in the first place. And that brings up the bigger point of one talking point that I've seen consistently is that people say scalping or reselling should be illegal. And there's nothing here that is illegal. People are buying a commercial product and they're choosing to sell it. There's nothing illegal about this action. The problem in and of itself isn't that there is a group of individuals buying thousands of these systems and selling them for profit through social media. The problem is the means in which we are able to purchase these products. And this means the fall is on the retailer or even the console manufacturer with their online store. Sony had their PlayStation Direct Q, which didn't even make sense. It had no rhyme or reason as to how it placed you. And when it originally came out, there was an easy way to exploit it. If you had, I believe if you had ad block on 
and you used Firefox, you could skip the entire line mm-hmm. and go right to the checkout. Yeah. Well, they eventually did patch that and they fixed it, but it was exploitable for several days during the launch week. And then you have, you know, Best Buy, Walmarts, you have bots set up that pick up all that stock the second it becomes available. There's no, this is now what, the second, third online era launch of hardware. Yep. I mean, I don't recall really the Wii and the Xbox 360 and how online shopping was back in you know 2005, 2006. I was still going to stores doing pre-orders. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure really how things were then in terms of online ordering. It was, dude, it was bad. I, I was one of the people that missed out on a Wii, and I had to wait, like... Because you remember how the shortage of, of the Wii was? Oh, yeah. I had to wait, like, six months before I got, got a Wii. Literally yeah, six the, months. The Wii was a mess. I was working at a GameStop at the time, and I remember my store had 15 Wii pre-orders when we opened them. And every day, when every single week when we got a new shipment in, there were people following that UPS truck. Even if we didn't have Wii's, they would sit there and say, did you get an order of Wii's? And, and we are like, no, we didn't get any Wii in today. They're coming in sometime this week, but I don't know. And it was always the same group of people. Some would camp out in the store when I would open at 9 o'clock, and they'd stand there until noon until the UPS truck showed up so they could hopefully get themselves a Wii. And, yeah, I guess that was before really online shopping became a big deal. And the Xbox 360 was another disaster for in-store pre-orders because... I was still at game. I was at EB Games at this point, and we never stopped taking reservations because Microsoft never cut it off. So we had like three hundred install reservations, and we only got like ten systems. Yeah, and it took months to go through the reservation allocation, and you know that was a disaster. But we saw the launch of Xbox One and PlayStation Four and Wii U, and that's when online retailers, I guess you would say, were more prominent. And that was a mess. There were some issues it, there. It didn't seem that but bad, though, did it? Like I It didn't know. seem that bad because the Wii U, you could find in stores yeah. pretty yeah. fast after launch. <laughs> right, right. Um, but even the PlayStation 4, I remember because I got... Amazon kind of messed me, messed with me bad. I pre-ordered a PlayStation 4 in September when they became available. And then it came launch day and they never shipped my system. And I was in talking to chat and customer service saying, when's it going to ship? And they're like, well, we don't ship them to launch day. I was like, yeah, but that's today. They're like, yeah, you know, we'll get around to it eventually. And they never shipped it as it got later into the day. And I was noticing on Amazon's website that they were having PlayStation 4s in stock for order on launch day. And they were up there for a while. Yeah. And it was aggravating to me that I could have bought a PlayStation 4 on launch day from Amazon and they would have shipped it out that day. Meanwhile, the one I pre-ordered two months prior still wasn't being prepped for shipping. And that's one thing that we haven't seen this gen is really available stock on launch day due to more limited supplies, I guess, in some cases. But how have none of these retailers, be it Best Buy, Microsoft, Sony, GameStop, how have they not come up with a solution to prevent bots or prevent people from exploiting their own vulnerabilities in their system where I can add a thousand PlayStation 5s to my cart? Hon- like, how is this still an issue? Honestly, Nate, I think they don't care. Like, I think mm-hmm. it's it's about moving as much product as quickly as possible for them, you know? And it's it's very unfortunate because the bots is what has caused this, right? So I, w- I want to go back and, and touch on a point that you said about, you know, you have nothing against resellers. I agree with you. I, I have nothing against reselling and reselling should not be illegal. I mean, I think it's it's something that, that people do, right? Like, but where I take issue is when you start using an automated bot to buy up, you know, all <laughs> available stock by running a script you know that's yes. that's something that i think needs to be you know needs to be regulated right but it there's there's two parts of this there's the actual bots themselves but there's also the website and mm-hmm. i've i've always been an advocate of you know having that 
that kind of human checkout approach where when you add something to your cart you've got a timer of x number of minutes you know say five minutes or two minutes or whatever it's like buying movie tickets or you know on Ticketmaster when you're buying concert tickets you have a small window of time to complete your order make a transaction without repercussions you know without your 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 item being swiped out from under you and i think that's where things really need to change but i just unfortunately nate i don't see it happening i think best buy walmart you know all these resellers oh sorry all these all these all these sellers want to move as much stock as they can as quickly as possible so i i I don't i think it's it's counterintuitive for them to do that you know like if you add something to your cart then you're basically blocking everyone else from getting it um and i think that kind of goes against what they're trying to do so i mean i'd like hopefully you know we'll, we'll see some changes when this happens and the thing that is really frustrating is that every time we hear about this we every time we hear about a new product that's going on pre-order we always hear things like it's going to be it's going to be different this time it's going to be a smooth launch everyone should have the opportunity <laughs> to get one and i mean that is just that's just a bunch of bs right you know <laughs> when you've got when you've got bots that literally buy things as soon as things go live there's no chance for an average human to get a hold of a product and i was very fortunate to get you know a series series s i didn't get a series x um i thought i got one but i didn't end up getting one amazon canceled my pre-order and i was very lucky to get a ps5 but you know i i worked very hard to get one like everyone else did and we shouldn't have to do that you know we shouldn't have to be competing against automated computer programs to get to get the product that we want but i think ultimately yeah i think these websites need to look at ways to make it fair on on people you know there there has to be a solution where the shopping cart or the transaction process you know fools a average computer bot it just throws them off right so they're basically rendered ineffective and that's easier said than done because i mean essentially i think all the bot is doing is just you know recording that 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 process of of checking out of of um of a website right but there has to be a solution here and i think i think you know we need to get there and unfortunately i don't i i I can't see it happening but what do you think i mean do you think that that these retailers are starting to to think about you know how they can make you know these products fair for everyone where they can get you know an, an average person can get the product that they're looking for i mean i'd like to think that they are but you do bring up the good point of if i'm amazon or i'm best buy i just want to move product i don't care who's getting it i don't care if it's a bot i just want your money and that's kind of that's the issue here is i've i buy art prints as like a collector and some of the sites i buy art prints from do as you say it's i get into that checkout and it says you have five minutes because as far as it's concerned the print i have in my cart is sold yeah if I don't check out within that time allotted, yeah. it goes back into the inventory and someone who is waiting in line can then add it to their cart and they can buy it. And the fact that we don't see that with, you know, at system launches, is just confounding. It's a simple thing. Maybe it isn't that simple to actually implement, but find a solution. I mean, yeah. Ticketmaster or like Hamilton, were Hamilton tickets being bought up by bots or were they legitimate people when they were going for you know on sale for Broadway shows, right? I mean, I never tried because I wasn't going to New York to see Hamilton. But I saw like people post pictures on social media where it showed them I'm twelve thousandth in line and I have a five hour wait until I can get tickets. Do that for consoles. Yeah. Set up an actual queue that works, and it's set you know set it up one per customer and make it. You can't exploit it. Yep. I don't care if you have to put a thousand captures before it. Do something that can prevent this from happening. And 
I mean, if I'm like the Microsoft Store and Sony's PlayStation Direct Store, you they should be the ones who have the best setup in place to ensure bots aren't picking all their you know inventory. Best Buy, GameStop. I mean, GameStop had some weird setup on their site where it was they claimed they were putting you in a wait like a waiting line and then the, and the site wouldn't load until it let you in to check out and then you just never wouldn't you would never advance and then if you reload the site it'd be like oh yeah we sold out like no you didn't how did you sell out like oh because our waiting line didn't work and they have to come up with something and i don't know what the answer is like if i'm gamestop or best buy do i prioritize maybe in-store orders over online orders I mean, not obviously not in the year of 2020, right? But in a like, if this happened in 2021 or we weren't in a pandemic, would I prioritize most of my allocation to in-store pre-orders over the online because online I can't control? I think so, but I mean, I mean, I know GameStop were were selling, you know, that they had pre-orders where people would go to the store and pick up their (laughs) pre-orders, but I kept hearing they only had like maybe between five yes. to 20 systems per store to sell anyway. Yeah. And I think ultimately limited. the problem goes back to there was just not enough stock to go around, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that cannot be discounted here because, um, okay, you've got a, you've got a, a reseller group that has 3,500 PS5s. But <laughs> if you, if you look at that, that article closer, it's, it's a scalper group, but it's basically, it's not just one person, right? It's like this organized group of people where they want you to sign up yeah. and then you get access to this bot program and then you can mm-hmm. buy up using the bot and then you you use the the Facebook group to sell your console or resell your console and yes. make a hundred pounds profit on it or whatever, or whatever you know profit you want to sell, uh, you want to get back mm-hmm. on it. So it's not just like one guy or you know like a couple of people it's it's like this group of like they're they're encouraging people to sign up run this bot yeah. program and and make some money doing it yeah know? it's it's kind of like a, it's it's like a little mafia yeah where they are the don and they're the captains and they're sending out the soldiers us who gives them the money to get this subscription that then will claim a PlayStation five and I can then sell it for profit. And I mean, that's the thing. Like it's, it's basically at least that 3,500 PlayStation five console thing. It was basically organized. I can't say organized crime because this isn't illegal, but this was an organized calculated move. This was a maneuver that was fully planned out and they knew exactly what the exploit was going to be. They knew how to attack and we need to figure out a defense to prevent this. And, you know, the next gen system launches for Sony and Microsoft are another six to seven years away. Will there be something that's put into place to prevent this? At this moment, I say no. I feel like and it's we just going to be the same thing over and over again. You yeah, know? <laughs> I mean, and it probably will. I mean, Nintendo is still having a very big year with Switch sales. Yeah. I'm sure a big supply of Switch hardware sold you know, Black Friday weekend, or even in the month of November and this coming December, some of it's going to be by resellers because the Switch is a hot item this year and there's money to be made by reselling it. I don't think we're necessarily going to see a group buy 4,000 Switches to sell them on Facebook or eBay, but there is going to be a certain percentage, you know, hundreds of them maybe, you know, being resold. So, I mean, it's not exclusive to this PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. It's also the Switch. And if a Switch revision comes in 2021, we're going to see a repeat of it there. But due to it being a revision and, you know, Nintendo can ship millions of them and there's not going to be, you know, tons of us sitting and saying, I got to get my hands on that right away. You know, restocks will be ample. PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, though they say they've shipped more than the predecessors. Do you believe that? Like, do you believe there are more Xbox Series X's and Series S's and PlayStation 5 shipped than what we saw at PlayStation 4's and Xbox One's? I don't. I don't believe it. Like, it goes back to the ease of getting 
those uh-huh. you know the, the last generation systems like i got a day one xbox one the day one edition i did pre-order it but i didn't i don't remember having to you know fight like tooth and nail to get one on a website you know like i just logged in yeah. that morning when it went when the pre-orders went live i pre-ordered and i was on my way and ps4 quite honestly nate i didn't even pre-order one i ended up getting <laughs> one like a week after they went live um th- there was enough stock to go around and it's hard for me to believe that they've sold more you know at the same point than the last generation it, is, it just doesn't that just doesn't compute with me right now but it's, it's like is demand just that much higher right now like we are talking about you know another this was many years ago so there's a new generation of gamer there's so there's more people who might be seeking out these systems and like as you said i remember when the playstation 4 and xbox one launch and even when the pre-orders were you know initially open for them it felt like you had a 15 minute window yeah. to put in a pre-order or just buy the system i don't think any of these systems have lasted 15 minutes 10 minutes if you were lucky maybe even five minutes it might have been 10 minutes, but you weren't getting anywhere because the checkout would all of a sudden not load and it would just say no more stock left. Yeah. But we did seem like we had a bigger window of availability for those previous systems compared to what we're seeing now. And if there are that many more systems available this time around, I wonder if it's clever marketing freeze where it's we shipped more to North America and areas of Europe because we didn't prioritize Japan and other regions so yes we did ship more yeah but maybe worldwide the allocation is still similar yeah that that could well be i mean it seems like it's it's you know a numbers game here right or is it just we want to say we're selling really well so we can create that need i if i say you're not going to have this for a while yeah i create demand i mean and i don't have supply microsoft never tell you their numbers anyway right so uh-huh. w- w- what is i'm not saying they're being dishonest i, I definitely not saying that but <laughs> what you know w- the numbers can be basically adjusted to mean different things and look yes you know it, it's it's very hard for me to believe that that's that's the case i guess is all i'm saying here i mean it very well could be the case that they have been selling more than what we saw from the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. If it is, you know, congratulations to Sony and Microsoft. You guys have systems that people are really excited for. And, you know, it's good for the industry that there is such demand and that the industry is growing and there's a lot of anticipation for this arrival of the new generation. But if you're Sony, and Microsoft, I get you have hit some production issues due to COVID. Maybe you could have approached this launch a little smarter. Even yeah. if maybe you could have been more transparent in what you're going to have available for launch. Just come out, you know, come right out and say, we're not going to have as many systems as we want. We're going to fix this problem early next year. So if you don't get it in these first two months, don't worry come February, we're going to have a lot more available to you. Microsoft has come out and said, we're probably going to have limited stock until April. That's a little concerning that they are basically saying they're not going to have stock readily available for the next four months. Now, that could just be clever marketing of creating demand. You don't want to say we're going to have a lot of stock available in December because then that creates the perception that maybe you're not selling well. And nobody wants that because we can look back to the Wii U. The Wii U launched, it sold over 2 million systems in November. It had a solid December. And all of a sudden, sales dropped off in January, where you could find a Wii U sitting on shelves everywhere. And I think the January NPD report was, I think, if I remember right, I think it was sub Mm 100,000. Yep. And nobody as a console manufacturer wants that unless it's because you have nothing on shelf. Right. And then that's a bigger question of, Why did you only have 30,000 systems for the entire month? But if I'm Microsoft, yeah, I don't want to say we're going to have a lot of stock available. I want to create that need, that demand from the consumer of, oh, if I see one on shelf, I got to pick it up. And Sony has already said, if you see, you're not going to see any on shelves. We know we have sold every single one. 
And the last time Sony came out with a statement like that, it was a lie. It was <laughs> when I think it was Jack Trenton said, if you see a PlayStation 5, or it might have been Jim Ryan, if you said, if you see a PlayStation 3 on the shelves, I'll give you $500. And the GameStop I was working at, we had seven in the back room because <laughs> nobody was buying them. And I'm sitting, I'm like, I should take a picture of these and send them to him. Like, I'll take my 3,500 bucks. And it's it's a weird situation. I mean, these resellers have definitely made things tougher. Yeah. So because there is ample stock seemingly in the hands of resellers that a lot of eager consumers could have in hand and play right now. That, that's my next question. So this is obviously hurting consumers. Do you think this is hurting? Um, Microsoft and Sony as well? This whole yes, thing? and that is a good question because it is a point I want to bring up in this video. Everyone will say that Sony and Microsoft don't care. They're getting money even from the scalpers who bought it from the retailer. But is Sony and Microsoft really making money? We know that their profit margins on hardware, especially at launch, is razor thin, if even existent. And these systems, I believe Microsoft and Sony have each come out and said, they're gonna take a loss on this hardware. Microsoft set it for the Series S. They're losing money on every Series S sold. And the X, we don't know if they're making a profit. So we can operate for this discussion that neither company is making money on hardware. Where they make money is from the game you're buying, the extra controller, the Game Pass subscription, PlayStation Plus, Xbox Live. For every minute, or for every system that's bought by a reseller and sits in their hands, that's a subscription or a game or a controller that's not being sold to a consumer who bought a PlayStation Five. So you're saying now, these, you know, you look at these tweets of the the you know the big wall of PS Fives from the UK group, <laughs> and you go through the <laughs> eBay listings of all the, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar Xbox Series X and PS Fives. And if you're a Microsoft employee or a Sony employee, you're just thinking, man, we, we need we need to figure out how to get these people to, mm -hmm. you know, to start using these systems. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd look at that wall and say, that's lost money for us. Because- yeah, Absolutely right, absolutely right. Every system sitting there is, yeah. you know, let's say that wall's 200 PlayStation 5s. I'm saying, well, that's 100 copies of Miles Morales that we didn't sell. That's 100 copies of Demon Souls we didn't sell. That's 150 DualSense controllers we didn't sell. That's a PlayStation Plus subscription we didn't sell. And Microsoft is sitting there saying, that's a Game Pass subscription we didn't sell. That's another controller. And that, or that's a memory card, the storage solution we didn't sell. We make money from our accessories and software. And this pile is lost money to us. Now, and now, Sony did try that incentive where they wanted you to sign up f with your <laughs> PSN ID, and based on yes. you know years of loyalty, you would get preferential treatment. That never even worked out though, because like people or uh, Walmart and Best Buy and Amazon, they all had PS fives up like days before that thing went live. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was like almost a, a, a non thing that had even happened, but. Do you think that that Microsoft and Sony should like try to come up with a system that does base, you know, brand loyalty um, and, and give people you know preferential treatment next time this happens? See, that's a tough question because how do you how do you select people based on? Is it just a lottery? Am I going to look? Didn't Microsoft have something where they had a contest? Yeah, where you could win based on like your gamer score in a month or something. I vaguely remember something like that being in recent weeks, but like, is it just a lottery of, if you've had Xbox Live for 10 years, you're placed in this tier and you get two entries versus if you just bought Xbox Live or Game Pass, you get one entry if you're below this. And like, what's the threshold of the criteria for it? Because the PlayStation 5, program it didn't seem like there was really any rhyme or reason it was just they selected random people yeah if you registered for it and they did eventually get their emails and they were able to buy their systems without much hassle and i could see them expand on this you just have to really be clear as to 
how you would select you know the people who are going to be welcome into it if it's just a random lottery uh, I mean it's uh, it's still unfortunate because it's it's luck of the draw yeah but I wouldn't mind if they did go something in that route that's really well planned out because I mean these resellers they're hurting Microsoft and Sony too and I know a lot of people are going to say who cares about the big corporation this can impact some of their forecast like right now we know Game Pass is a big deal for Microsoft they know how many pieces of hardware they have shipped they may have said we're looking at an attach ratio of let's say one Game Pass subscription for every two Series X and Series S sold well now if you have several thousand who knows how many thousand we're talking about here Xboxes being held by resellers and don't forget Series X and Series S Mm -hmm. so you got two SKUs you know to to think about and you know they're looking at that saying well we're below that ratio why well it's because it's not in the hand of consumers or Sony's looking at it saying we want to see our game ratio per PlayStation 5 be three especially in these first few launch months leading to the end of the fiscal year. Well, the more systems being in the hand of scalpers, that's going to throw that ratio off. So when they're looking at their numbers, they're going to have to adjust maybe their fiscal forecast, or they're going to adjust certain expectations because the sales aren't being met. And I know someone's going to listen and say, well, that's probably not accurate. Yeah, because in the grand scheme of things, what's 3,500 PlayStation 5s? If they shipped, let's say, 3 million in the month of November, what's 3,500? It's 1%. But that's one group, though. I mean, I, and I right. guess we don't know how many, you know, scalp groups are out there and how many PS5s right. are in the reseller market, but it's a damn sight more than 3,500. I mean, yeah. you know. Like, it's, yeah, it's not going to be in hundreds of thousands, but, you know, it could be, could be easily 50, be in the range 000? of 50K. Yeah. Yeah, it could be, you know, 50K. And, I mean, that's a lot of PlayStation 5s when you as a company are looking to sell software and accessories to really begin to make your profits. Because a $70 game there and another controller, now those are each, DualSense is $70? Yep. So it's $140 to one system. Now let's extrapolate that by 50,000 systems talking some serious change now yeah and for a company you look at these type of stats you look at the attach ratios you look at new subscriptions based on the hardware sold and this is messing with them and it's something that i haven't really seen anyone discuss because i get it you want to focus on the consumer especially when it comes to reselling and scalping of new hardware you want to focus on how you know the consumer is for lack of a better word, getting screwed. But the companies are also getting screwed. And I get they're not as big of a victim as the individual who's desperately seeking out a PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X right now and can't get it because the scalpers continue to screw them over using bots. But this this impacts the entire industry. And that's where we you don't give in to these type of sellers. Wait it out they will either return the systems or they're going to start slashing their prices because they don't want to sit on that stock because the individual who dropped a hundred thousand dollars on playstation 5s they probably don't have cash in hand to cover that yeah they need to sell it to pay their credit card bill or you know pay that balance and you wait them out they're going to be if you wait a scalper or a reseller out they're going to be the ones to blink first absolutely yeah they'll, they'll drop their price before they yeah. um you know do anything else they have to like yeah, they have to they're the ones who have to act not yeah. the consumer eventually their their margins will continue to shrink you know and yes and hopefully you know when that like i said when that that time comes where you can log into amazon and add a ps5 or an xbox series x to your cart and mm-hmm. check out on you know without being interfered with then that's when you'd be yeah if i was a scalp i'd be pretty pretty nervous you know and about that, the the 300 i'm sitting you know i've got sitting in my garage you know that I, i'm trying to sell for a profit and that's the thing is if all of a sudden i can go to amazon even if it's only a 10 minute or 15 minute availability window 
that just cut into my price probably 20 to 30% because it's, it's available for 15 minutes today. What's it going to be available next time? What if it's 20 minutes? Now, next thing, it's an hour. My, now, my profit margin is shrinking. I have to act because the consumer is now looking away from me saying, I can get it for retail price. I don't, I'm not even going to look at you anymore. And that's where the consumer has all the power. And that's what everyone has to be reminded of. You have the power. If you don't give in to the scalpers, they don't have anything. All they have is a big pile of systems that they have to return to the retailer. So don't give in to them. Make them blink and say, I'll sell the PlayStation 5 to you for five fifty. A little higher than retail, yep. but it's within a reasonable amount and say for five fifty, you cover charging or you cover shipping. Mm-hmm. And now you basically it's pretty much what shipping would cost you anyways. Yep. So you got a pretty good deal there. Yeah. But you have the power over the over any reseller. They don't have power over you. They may look like they do because they have the stock, but you have the cash. They want the cash. You don't give them that, and they have, they'll have they do something. They have to react to your inactivity. That's true. You don't have to move. They have to move, and that's, that's where it yep. goes. You know, that's what it ends up being. That's right. It's a game of chess, and you're well protected, and they're sitting there in check. And eventually, it's going to be checkmate for them, whether it's by the consumer hand, by not acting, or by Sony and Microsoft giving ample stock. That's right. No matter what, they're going to lose. Just don't give them the satisfaction of a sale. Yep, and right. definitely, definitely don't believe any of the sad sap stories that they're giving of, oh, this is to put you know food on our table. You bought up thousands of PlayStation 5s and you're selling them at a profit margin of two to three times what they're selling. It's not so you can put bread on your table that you're selling a PlayStation 5 for $2,000. It's greed, and you're so an opportunity to exploit yep. a lack of a better word, weak user base who was desperate and didn't want to miss out, and was willing to part with a large sum of money for a product they could have waited four months for and got for retail price. You're not Robin Hoods. You're not doing it to, you know, doom over the billion-dollar corporation of Sony or Microsoft or the retailer you're doing it out of greed and you know it's really that simple but we can move into some streamlab questions and we had a hundred dollar donation from steve one of the individuals that this episode is dedicated to and they write hi nate and mvg remark and question nintendo had labo ring fit etc microsoft has game pass Completely different, maybe, but in my honest opinion, Sony misses innovation. What will hurt in the long term? How can Sony innovate and expand, if not now, but in the future? Um, yes, Nintendo looks to innovate in many, many different ways. It's their hardware, their software. Microsoft is innovating in their own way with Game Pass and moving to the service side of the industry. Sony did introduce some innovation this generation, and it seems to be specifically with the DualSense controller. Um, Sony is kind of the, they're a traditional gaming company, and I know a lot of people like to assign that to Nintendo, but Sony looks at what works and they stick to it. And that's why every PlayStation iteration has kind of just been a case of better technology, we can make better games, and that's what the consumer wants. They do have to innovate in their own ways. They've tried PlayStation Move, but the market basically looked at that as a cheap imitation of the Wii controller. And they tried to do 3D on the PlayStation 3. 3D never really took off. I could see Sony innovate in some sort of way, maybe their own Game Pass idea this generation. But right now, their innovation is purely on that controller side and they're trying to innovate in ways that are a little more subtle and not industry shaking. I think, um, the dual sense stuff, I mean, there's definitely innovation there, but my guess would be that we'll probably see a new generation or new iteration of their PSVR tech, which I think will be 
a lot more fleshed out um hopefully Mm -hmm. no wires to mess around with and a much better user experience not that not that psvr was not but i think it's just going to refine the virtual reality experience yeah playstation vr was really cool although limited by the technology available at the time but their psvr2 could be quite innovative if they push vr in a exciting new way because you definitely have the hardware power now and it still might come down to whether or not the market adapts to vr but vr is a it's definitely a direction that we're going to see a lot of innovation in over the years it's just a question of will the market really ever fully embrace vr and that's going to be a question for a long time then had a dollar donation from jackie g who writes hello gentlemen how likely do you how likely do you believe a state of play is in December, like 2019? Maybe even the same week as the Game Awards? Um, that's a good question because I don't know if Sony is in dire need of a state of play right now. The PlayStation 5 is out of stock pretty much worldwide. They could potentially date some of their early 2021 PlayStation 5 releases like Ratchet and Clank but I don't know if you need a state of play in December to do that. I could see them wait until maybe January to begin to communicate some of their 2021 plans for PlayStation 5 game awards. I would, I could see Sony being there on their own with some sort of announcements, but that'll be a topic we address in a future episode. Uh, then we had a $5 donation from Symphonic Balance, who writes, People keep talking about the successor to the Switch, like a pro, for example. Take a grain of salt with your wishes, as the Wii was super popular, like the Switch, and the Wii U followed. I enjoy my Wii U, but not everyone else did. Keep up the good work. <laughs> I, I like the Wii U, but I also think that, um, you know, the switch pro whatever that whatever that entails uh will not will not be the next wii u system (laughs) i think uh nintendo knows exactly (laughs) what the what the switch pro will be and i think honestly nate i think they're preparing it as we speak for some launch at some point next year yes i would agree with that and as we've kind of talked about in previous videos Switch Pro should just be a new revision of the current Switch, you know, a hybrid model, maybe the introduction of a console only model, but still going to keep the that Switch element to it. So we're not going to look at like a Wii U situation. Now the Switch successor, as in like the actual Switch 2, I would assume Nintendo is going to keep the same hybrid approach. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do do something different and we get a Wii U 2 type repeat, but really never know what Nintendo's going to do with hardware, especially their next generation or successor, because, I mean, you went from the GameCube to the Wii, and then the Wii to the Wii U, and the Wii U to the Switch. I mean, Nintendo's always looking to innovate with their hardware, and maybe this time, when we get a successor, they actually follow a path that they set forth with the previous hardware, and we don't see any crazy new direction that doesn't make any sense like the wii u and i i did enjoy the wii u it was just limited by the technology available at the time we then had a two dollar donation from mick chicken right hello nate and mvg doom eternal on switch is now a digital only release do you think bethesda is reconsidering support for the console or maybe they simply notice people are leaning towards digital purchases because of the pandemic Best wishes from Poland. Um, I don't think it's because Bethesda is reconsidering support for the Switch. And I also don't think it's because they are leaning towards digital purchases because of the pandemic. I think it was more so a case of return on investment. Agree. They, they took a look at the numbers. I think the decision was made that it was probably best to keep it digital the mm-hmm. game i believe i believe nate is an 18 gigabyte download for the switch which yes. means that it would need to fit on a 32 gigabyte cartridge and there mm-hmm. is a pretty expensive cost in doing <laughs> so so i think the ultimate decision was made that they probably weren't going to 
make the or it would it would significantly eat into their profit margins and mm -hmm. i think they they decided that they would leave it as a digital download yes like they could have gone with a 16 gig card and done the mandatory three gigabyte download but the 16 gig card is still a little pricey they could have got away with it at 60 dollars, which they are charging for this but i think at the end of the day one factor that has to be touched on is when Doom 2016 came to Switch, Nintendo published it. So they ate some of that cost to bring the game to retail shelves. Nintendo is not footing that bill this time. This is a Bethesda fully published game on the platform. And if we actually look at Bethesda published games for Switch, they have all been digital only. Skyrim was also something that Nintendo assisted with distribution, but Wolfenstein Young Blood was not. And I think Nintendo also had a hand with Wolfenstein 2 on Switch. I'm not 100% sure of that one though, but like Wolfenstein Young Blood was digital only, and now seeing Doom Eternal be digital only, I think it's just Bethesda looking at the cost of the carts and maybe what they're expecting for potential sales and saying it's not worth us doing retail at this time. Maybe down the line we can consider it, but right now, digital only, and we'll see how the sales go. I will pick it up on the Switch. I enjoyed Doom 2016 on Switch, and I'm curious how they got a game that is even faster and more wild, like Doom Eternal, to run on Switch and see how, see how good of a job Panic Button did. Then had a $5 donation from Skit Tittles, who writes, I love Yakuza Like a Dragon. You love Yakuza Like a Dragon. Can we talk about how good Yakuza Like a Dragon is? It is a great game. It is one of the best turn-based RPGs I've played in recent memory. I need to uh, I need to get back and, and keep playing it. I, I started playing it. It's cool, but it's... I finished... I played and finished Judgment this year, as, uh, mm -hmm. as is the joke on the Spawn cast. <laughs> I uh, I really enjoyed Judgment, but those games they require a significant amount of time to play through, and yes. I just wasn't ready to jump into another one. But I've heard amazing things about the game. I've I've played about an hour of it so far. I've been enjoying it. Uh, once I get through the backlog of games I'm currently working on, I'll definitely revisit it. Yes, it's it's a really good game, and anyone with an an Xbox One or Series X or Series S should definitely look into it because it is a fantastic RPG. We then had a $100 donation from Calvin Atkinson, who this episode is also dedicated to, along with Steve. And Calvin writes, Hey, Nate and MVG, what do you think the chances of a Pokemon MMO ever happening are? Because I'm fairly convinced Game Freak wouldn't want to do it and Nintendo wouldn't be willing to hand it over to another development team. I think the only Pokemon MMO we are ever going to get is Pokemon Go. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else beyond that that we'll get. Yeah, Game Freak seems pretty set in their ways in the direction that they want to take the Pokemon franchise, and it works for them. Look at Pokemon Sword and Shield. It's I think it's just around 20 million sales now, and the DLC was very well received. Crown Tundra has been praised, and it was actually more praise than the base game because it really opened up a lot of areas of the game and people like the exploration and the new areas so hopefully the next pokemon game is more like the crown tundra dlc and less like sword and shields base game and that may please the pokemon fan base that was looking for a little more in a next gen home console pokemon experience but it does seem like Game Freak and Nintendo aren't going to explore the MMO scene with this franchise anytime soon. And this has definitely been one of those wants of people dating back to since I was a kid where people would look at games like World of Warcraft or Guild Wars and saying, could you imagine a Pokemon game like this? And I mean, that was 20 years ago and we're no closer to that dream coming true than, you know, than we are now. So maybe in a hundred years. <laughs> We then had a $25 donation from Zadia Quest. They did not leave a message or a question, but thank you for the donation. And that will do it for today's episode of Nate the Hate. I'd like to thank MVG for joining me as always. Thanks for having me on, Nate. 
great to chat as always and i think we'll probably have another episode later on this week as well yes this may be a double dose of hate this week so you'll have to stay tuned for that and this episode was once again dedicated to calvin atkinson and steve if you'd like to support the channel we have a stream labs link in our description below if you donate a hundred dollars or more the episode will be dedicated to you otherwise you can donate any amount ask us a question we will answer at the end of the episode and you can find a link to mvg's recent videos in which he does some emulation on the xbox series s in the description below as well as a link to his youtube channel and until next time continue to embrace the hate <laughs> <laughs>